Thank you. So, um, as Jesse just said, my name is Seth. Uh, I'm a colorist and finishing editor based in Woodstock, New York. Um, uh, as Jesse also said, I've finished uh, Academy Award winning films. Uh, I've also finished student films. I've finished everything in between. Um, I've tended to work on documentaries. Um, although it's not the only thing that I work on, but it's my favorite thing to do. And um, that's why I'm here today to talk to you about um, editing for uh, for and post for documentaries. So um, the the challenge with documentaries is that there's uh, usually less set of time. There's less uh, uh, you know uh, more run and gun camera work. Uh, there's more and more varied content. Um, as uh, Jesse noted, I work on a show called The First Forty Eight which routinely cuts back and forth between like 360i and UHD, uh, which is rare, right, for scripted, um, for scripted uh, programming. Um, so uh, also frequently archival assets, and sometimes a ton of archival assets, like OJ Made in America had hours and hours and hours of archival assets. Um, so, and, uh, you know, a lot of times it might be like different DPs using different cameras in different environments, shooting, um, you know, different people. And so, you know, the bottom line is that Docs are really hard. They're, in my opinion, I've worked on both, uh, and in my opinion, they're significantly more difficult than working on scripted content. So um, I personally tend to use Resolve and Avid. Um, today I'm in Avid. Um, you know, the advantages of working in Resolve, I think, are obvious, like color pipeline, right? But the advantage of working in Avid, uh, I think it's an underrated finishing tool because the conform side is so much easier, right? So if you're given an off a timeline from um, um, an offline that was cut in Media Composer, like in, at least in my world, most still are, um, the conform end is significantly easier. So you don't have to recreate the lens flare. It comes in perfectly exactly how they had it in offline. And uh, that is crucial for me. Um, and so... Uh, the problem with Avid, of course, is that it lacks some finishing tools, uh, um, and I think that's where BCC, something like BCC comes in, right, where you can plug all the holes that Avid doesn't ha handle. So dealing with things like um, like dead pixels, uh, dealing with things like uh, uh, flicker, or good stabilization, um, removing crew from a scene, right? These are all the kinds of things that we have to deal with um, in the documentary world all the time. And so those are some of the things that I'd like to tackle today. Um, I would just like to note in passing that I am on um, Avid Media Composer version um, 8. Uh, I'm using BC 11.0.3, if I'm not mistaken, which I think is latest greatest. I just downloaded it a couple of days ago. Um, I'm on a, a trash can mask with... I believe 16 gigabytes of RAM, so not a ton, um, but it's a decent computer. And um, oh, and finally, I'd just like to note that um, I'm talking through my telephone right now because Avid tries to grab uh, audio hardware, and um, so I hope it's not okay. But if I'm not, I apologize for that. So, um, all right, let's just jump right in. So, um, I've got this shot here, which is a pretty nice looking shot, right? Um, but um, I suspect even where you are, and certainly where I am, I can see that there's a, a big dead pixel right in the, in the frame right here. And that's a pr problem on a couple of levels. One is that it looks bad, um, most importantly. Uh, it definitely would attract the attention of viewers. But furthermore, that's going to fail any QC that it goes through, right? So thankfully, BCC has uh, uh, a tool for fixing that pretty easily. So I'm going to go and grab the uh, pixel fixer right there, drop it onto my segment. Okay, and I'm going to uh, my effect mode. So um, as you can see, there's a target point right here. This is point one. So I'm just going to go and grab it and get it kind of in the bottom part of the pixel lens. Okay, and zoom in. I'm using zooming in using the command key. If I was on a PC, it would be control. And once I'm in the ballpark of where I want to be, now I can go you know, do some more finesse adjustments using the target lines, right? And it's a little bit, the, the default, which is 2.5, sorry, 2.5 size, is just a little bit too small. Since um, I'm working using an AVX plugin, this is going to uh, work, operate like any other effect in the Avid effect world, in the Avid effect um, palette, right? Which is to say that, 
I can make broad adjustments using the shift key, and I can make small adjustments using the um, option key. Um, I'm going to make a small adjustment, right? I'm going to do maybe 2.5, 2.6, right? So that looks pretty good right there. And so this is a green dotted effect on my system. I should be able to simply hit play. And you'll note that what's happening here is that DCC is averaging out the, um, the nine pixels that surround my dead pixel and, and um, filling it in, right? So that my dead pixel has not disappeared, which is um, terrific. I love it. And also legal in terms of getting it past the broadcast QC. Um, now, if I wanted to, I could go in and save this as a preset, um, which is terrific. But uh, in this case, actually, I'm also, nothing I can do is just grab it and pop it in a bin. And so, you know, the reason that I would do that is because, typically speaking, a dead pixel is not going to affect just one shot. It's going to affect everything that hit that sensor at that time. So maybe anything that was shot that night. So, for example, this next shot has the exact same the pixel in the exact same spot, right? And so now I can go and grab the BCC pixel fixer, drop it onto any number of other clips, and, and there it is fixed. So now I've got a fix across two shots. Um, sweet. Uh, should we talk about uh, flicker? So on this next shot, right, I've got um, a shot of a person on an escalator, and if I hit play, you'll note that there is a pretty severe flicker. Right, um, and I'll just scroll through slowly here. So there it is, right there. If I go and simply drop Flickr Fix PCC Flickr Fixer on, okay, and render it. The shot looks okay. It doesn't look perfect. It does a good job. This would certainly pass network QC or at some festival QC or wherever, but. Um, I don't think it looks 100% great. It seems as if there's a dissolve almost right from the dark part of the image to the bright part of the image. So while this is a million times better, in my opinion, it's probably not perfect. Let's actually make it a, a little bit nicer. So if I go in and I find the point, there it is, right there where my flicker is occurring, I'm going to do an add edit. Okay. And I'm going to go into Avid's color correction mode. So. Okay, so I've got my, I've got broken this up into two segments, my, my pre-flicker and my post-flicker sections. And I'm just going to grab where I want, you know, I'm going to grab, I'm going to go to my pre-flicker section. And I'm going to use this from chip, and I'm going to just grab a somewhat representative uh, color from this person's cheek. And I'm going to go to the two chip, right? And I'm going to grab roughly the same spot. Going into the curves tab, I'm going to go and I want to confirm that natural matches off, okay? Because natural match uh, will will affect the limo, which is in fact what I want to happen right here. And I'm going to simply go to my uh, my pre flicker section here and do match color. Okay, that's ballpark. I don't actually need this to be perfect quite yet. I'm just trying to get rid of the flicker, so I might tweak it a tiny bit, but I just really want to be in the kind of in the zip code of where um, of so that the pre-flicker and post-flicker are in the same kind of area code. So now I'm going to highlight both of these clips by using my lasso, okay? And because I'm working in uh, uh, in Avid, right? Anything in the the Avid effect palette is going to work identically, whether it's a forest sapphire or or Avid native effect, right? So because I have two clips highlight, and um, I can turn these into one segment, right? Like a um, Compound clip almost by holding down the option key, and I'm going to do flick fixer on uh, on both of these shots, adding them together as a compound clip. Okay, so I hold down the Alt key. I'm going to render it, and now, um, so that looks pretty good. There's still, you know, maybe a, a little bit of movement from the beginning of the frame to the end, but not tremendously noticeable. Certainly, it'll pass. Uh, network you see. I'm pretty happy with this. Now I can color correct this as needed. As it would, it would, at this point, it becomes like any other segment in the timeline, any other clip in the timeline. Terrific. Um, so I've got this shot right here. 
these are all the kinds of exactly the kinds of problems, right, that we would deal with in the doc world. Dead pixels, Flickr, right? These are exactly the kinds of problems that um, you know, run and gun producers have to deal with where, you know, they're trying to catch an authentic moment. They don't have time to set up the camera perfectly. There's not a tripod, there's not there's no um, you know, they're using natural lighting. This shot, pretty decent looking shot, in my opinion. It's just kind of a framed pretty and the colors are nice. But you'll note that there's kind of an unnatural wobble in the shot, which I don't totally love. Unfortunately, that's pretty easily fixable, right? And most any um, nonlinear editor is going to have a stabilizer, certainly Avid and Resolve Wood or Premiere. Um, but the BCC optical stabilizer has got a couple of features that I like. So I'm going to go and drop that on my clip. Uh, Boris is helpfully telling me to please click the Analyze button and continue. I will oblige the Analyze button right here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Analyze. And BCC is going to analyze my, uh, my clip. Pretty quick. Okay. Um, you might that it did a slight resize on the clip. That's because auto scale is enabled by default. Um, and as it should be, because in 99% of stabilization cases, that's the correct, uh, that's the correct way to approach it. Um, so if I hit play, it's a green dotted effect, which is nice. You can watch it in real time. But, well, it helps a little bit, but the, there's still a little bit of an unnatural wobble. I'm not 100% satisfied with that right off the bat. I think that's because um, I think that's because it's stabilizing only based on my translation. So I'm going to switch that to translation and rotation. And you'll note that when I do that, I do not have to reanalyze anything. Once the analyzation is done, it's done. I don't have to ever do it again. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit play again, and uh, looks pretty great. It looks as if it's locked down, which may or may not be what I'm trying to do, but the but the stabilize is perfect. So that was exactly what it took. Uh, hitting the uh, hitting the uh, adding the rotation in. Now I'll note that when when people hang out with me in my color suite. They are, um, they'll often surprised at how often I use the rotation effect, I'm sorry, the, the uh, optical stabilizer. Um, I typically don't, I mean, this looks good, uh, you know, like setting it up as if it's on a, on a, uh, on a tripod, but I don't, I actually typically will use this more often than not anyway to smooth out motion. So I've now lost that resize that it did earlier, and now I, I can hit play. Right, and now it's got a really smooth-looking motion, which is much more natural. Right, so you know what? You know, some t instances uh, require uh, locking the camera down as if it was on a tripod. A lot of instances will require just making the motion look smooth, like I've done here. I actually think that this shot looks great. Um, so. Um, so that's the uh, PCC optical stable. Uh, you know, one, one other thing I'll just note in passing, sorry. One other thing I'll just note in passing is that um, you can change the frame that you're using as your anchor point by using this reference frame slider, um, which is a great little feature. Um, I don't think most uh, stabilizers have that. Um, and you can also adjust the amount of smoothing and how, how it works using this smoothing range slider. Um, so that's the um, BCC uh, optical stabilizer. This shot actually looks like the producers didn't have much of a chance to do like white balance and it's also slightly out of focus. It's a decent looking shot otherwise. I like the background, but my subject is a little bit out of focus and the, the, the color is a little bit off too. It's exactly the kinds of things that we deal with in the, the um, doc world all the time, right? They have to get that authentic moment and we have to try and fix it in post. Um, I think in this case, I'm going to um, grab the BCC video scope effect and I'm going to drop it on a track above. Okay. So, you know, uh, I'll just note in passing that um, other, uh, all non-linear editors, I think, have scopes, onboard scopes, right? Um, Avid certainly does. Um, the added scopes are 
functional, but there's only six or seven options to choose from. And I think more importantly, you know, they're, they're decent scopes, but, but the bigger issue is that when I hit play, they do not update. And that's a little bit of a fatal flaw from my point of view. Um, so thankfully, uh, that's not the case with the um, BCC video scopes. Hey, Seth. Which are, um, yes. Sorry. Can you enlarge your AVID window a little bit more? We're getting requests. Yeah, sure I can. Um, the composer window? Um, I'm not sure, actually. Okay, I'm going to enlarge it. And just, yeah, if just people are having trouble just seeing a little bit, um, like, the BCC titles and whatnot. The, sure, the, absolutely. The text can be a little bit bigger. Thank you. Right. Yes, absolutely. So, um, as a matter of fact, one of the cool things in the video scopes is that um, do this here um, is that um, we can actually adjust the the um, sorry effect editor. We can actually adjust the um, size of any of these as uh, needed, right? Um, I can also adjust the position, right? Um, let's take that off. So, you know, I actually don't. I I, I kind of like seeing. Uh, my subject a little bit more, so I'm going to turn off the Instagram, right? And let's make this a little bigger so y'all can see. So I'm looking at at this. Oh, you know, a couple of things before I move any further is that um, I want to change this color space from its default of uh, Rec 601 to its color space uh, to it to the color space of Rec 709, right? And for reasons that I don't 100% uh, understand, Avid it assumes everything is uh, 16 to 35 video range. Or, so we're going to switch to that in here, but that wouldn't be a necessary step if one was working in, say, Resolve or Premiere. Great. So um, I can see by looking at my uh, parade that um, my reds are just a little bit hot. Right? You know, before I go further, I just want to note that by default, right, we had those five um, windows up here. We had a uh, waveform monitor. We had uh, uh, RGB, what uh, BCC calls an RGB waveform monitor, what I would call an RGB parade, uh, YCBCR waveform, and vectorscope. And um, you can change, as I said, you can change the location, the size, the layout. You could change, you could hide or, or show uh, whichever windows you want. I already hid the histogram, um, right? And uh, you can also change the opacity of the overlay. You can also change the color scheme, right? So that's easier. Um, one thing I, I love is you spend hours staring at waveform monitors as I do. Being able to change the source color in the waveform monitor is kind of amazing because you can see really easily what uh, what luminance is what color, right? So I can see like these are obviously my reds and uh, this is shirt, this is the, the window. This makes my life really easy. And um, right, so I'm looking at the shot and I can see that um, my red channel is kind of out of whack. I see that there's a lot of red in the image. There's a little bit of a, a little bit more red in this image. Red is the most powerful color, so I would expect it to be a little bit higher than my green and blue, but you know, in like a perfectly neutral shot, right, these should be um, about equal, and clearly they're not. They're not even close to being equal. So, um, so um, I'm going to make this window smaller again for a second. So, um, I'm going to drop on the, um, go into the BCC color and, color and tone section, and I'm going to drag on the color balance effect. Okay, so color balance lets me uh, adjust the RGB channels independently. Because I'm in an AVID effect editor, I can affect these the same way that I would affect any other AVID effect, which is to say I can use my shift key for big giant changes. I can use my option key for little tiny changes, right? Um, so looking at the uh, my RGB parade, I see I want to bring my red channel back a little bit. Okay. Looking better. Um, I can still see my chroma is just a little bit hot. Maybe I'll drop on a, um, a color correction. Right, so because I'm in the Avid Effect palette, this is uh, drop, dropping a second 
effect on here is going to work like dropping any other second effect, which is just a long way of saying that I'm going to hold down the Option key or Alt if I was on a PC and drop that on top, and that creates a um, uh, a nest, right? So I have my raw video. I've got my um, uh, my uh, channel uh, controls there, and here's a straight up color corrector. Um, I think I'm just going to throw the saturation back just a touch. All right. I, don't, I know my window's a little bit small right now, but I'm looking at my vector scope and pulling back my chroma just a touch. And um, so I'm pretty happy with this shot. Um, you know, the one thing that I'm not uh, totally in love with is that um, it's. You know, we've got this, the whole shot is a little bit out of focus. Um, I'd like to, you know, in the documentary world where production doesn't always have a ton of time to set up, you know, it's up to us as finishing editors and colorists uh, to sometimes tell a story, right? So in this case, I, I think I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to sharpen the image. I only want to sharpen uh, my subject. That would really, I think, attract the eye to him and away from all of these bright lights and colorful colors in the background. So I'm going to go back to my image restoration tab, and I'm going to drop a magic sharp on top. Again, I'm going to hold down the Alt key so that I'm throwing this on higher up in my nest. Okay. So my previous effects were not deleted; they're just you know inside of here. All right. And um, I'm going to go into effects mode. And um, you know, there's a few ways I could do this. I could do this um, using Pixel Chooser. I think in this case, the easiest way is uh, to launch Mocha. So I'm not a Mocha expert, um, but I can do some simple stuff in here. So like this. Uh, so I think what, what we're going to do here is we're going to create an X uh, an X blind layer. Okay. We do not need this to be, for the purposes of what we're doing right now, we do not need this to be anywhere near perfect. Okay. Um, and we'll track it forward in case there's any movement. Okay. It doesn't appear as if there's a lot of movement. He's moving a little bit, but not a ton. For the purposes of what we're doing, we a very loose power window is all we really need. Right? So I will exit. I'm happy with that motion track. Let's see what we've got. If I go and look at my mask map, okay, it's doing exactly kind of what I hoped it would doing. I'm pretty satisfied with that track, but um, I do want to feather the edges substantially, and that is right here. Okay. So um, let's turn off our mask mat. And so um, I know the screen is a little bit small, but uh, hopefully what you can see is, um, actually, let's render this. Okay. So hopefully what you can see is that we've got a sharpening effect on our subject to attract the viewer's attention to him. And the rest is just a little bit out of focus, which is nice. So it, it's still pretty. I still like it. It's colorful and beautiful. I like the lights, but we're but we're but we're, what we're but we are attracting the viewer's attention to our subject eyes. And if I hit play here, I'm pretty satisfied with how that came out. Maybe I would bump up the sharpening a little bit more, um, but um, but I'm relatively satisfied with that. So using the uh, the uh, scopes, uh, the uh, BCC video scopes, I was able to see the, see the problem. I fixed it uh, uh, based on what I found, and then um, did some uh, creative work from attracting the viewer's attention to it. So these are exactly the kinds of things that we do in the doc world all the time. So, um, so I've got a another thing that we do in the doc world all the time uh, is uh, we're getting assets from all over, from telephones. Some telephone sometimes, uh, you know, held uh, in portrait mode. We're getting stock footage. We might get stock footage from, you know, 20 different stock footage facilities, and 
there might be some, you know, 23, there might be some 24, there might be some 25, there might be some 30. If you're doing a, a documentary about, um, you know, um, Jimmy Carter, you all of your footage is going to be, uh, you know, SD. It's all going to be uh, interlaced. And so that's going to create all kinds of problems. And that's where a tool like the um, Upres tool comes into play. So um, I did a search in the effect palette for BCC Upres, or actually just search for Upres, and I'm going to um, drop that on. It um, somehow magically knows that my shot is uh, is um, 720, um, and here's my transform, right? Um, and uh, here's my pixel aspect, pixel aspect ratio. So yeah, it's correct. I'm in uh, DB NTSC, uh, and my size is so uh, I think it's I guess this is 720 by 486, right? Um, and so uh, and the cool thing in here is that the uh, super high quality um, upres control, right? And with a, with more customization than most nonlinear editors are going to have, and also some many options, right, for choosing how you do the upres, whether you want it, uh, you know, whether you're in draft mode or whether you want it to be smooth, sharpened, and so on, right? I'd also like to um, show um, BCC Reframer. Um, so BCC Reframer um, is a handy little tool for getting footage from one aspect ratio um, into uh, into a, a, another, right? So, for example, if you've got four by three footage that you're trying to get into a sixteen by nine timeline, which is what exactly what I've got here. So, um, so I've got my my foreground and I have my background, right? So, at my foreground transform. I want to um, scale it up. Okay, great. Looks pretty good. Um, now, for certain networks, I'm thinking of A&E, for example, but others, you know, this is not. They do not want, uh, and and uh, uh, other delivery sources, right? Do not want black bars on the side. And that's for something like Reframer really comes in handy. So um, I'm going to go to my background to transform. Actually, before I do that, I just want to crop my uh, my program a little bit. There we go. Okay. Terrific. So by default, it's showing up with a blur. Um, I think this has become kind of basic, right? For uh, for converting telephone or SD footage into an HD or higher timeline, I don't totally love it personally. Um, I kind of prefer maybe the glow uh, or mosaic. Right. And the important thing here is that, I mean, in the in the online color finishing editing world, we don't always have a choice of how this appears. This might be chosen by the offline folks. But when we do have this choice, the important thing here is that I can save this as a preset and apply it across other projects, other shows, other episodes, right? But um, I also um, love that I can drop this into a bin and I can have this uh, applied to any, however many shots I choose. Then I'm selecting the same way that I would select any other effect. I can multi-select using the shift command. I can lasso from left to right. I can um, hold down the option key to turn multiple selections into one clip. So I can do anything I want. So in this case, I could had if I had three shots in a row that were all standard depth, I could um, just double click on the the clip in question, and I'm applying the exact same look to all of them. In this case, these are uh, HD shots, which is why they look a little bit funny, but the principle stands. So if you're getting footage from multiple stack footage places, it's not uncommon for them for say everything from one stack footage place to be one size and uh, stack footage from another facility to be another size. So this is a way to have a uh, you know a uh, for example a Getty Shutterstock effect and uh, drop it onto all of them, which I think is super useful. Sweet. Um, 
you know, part of the nature of documentary filmmaking is, as I said a couple of times, is, you know, like capturing that moment, capturing that authentic moment when your subject speaks. And a lot of times you may not have the producers or, the, you know, the uh, camera people may not have the time to set up properly. They can't set up the mics properly. The cameras aren't set up properly. The white balance is set up properly. Or sometimes they won't notice that there's crew in the background. I can't even tell you the number of times that I had to deal with yesterday, as a matter of fact. So this is a, a really a super frequent occurrence, right? I don't know if you can see it, but there's uh, camera operators in the background of the shot reflecting along the window. Um, it's fair, you know, as long as they got the shot uh, and they kept their subject being authentic, I don't really care. I mean, I don't love it. Ideally, everything would come in perfect, but, um, but you know, it's, uh, if we do get it like this, we're, it's our job, right, to make it perfect. And so fortunately, I think using Mocha, I think I can pull this off. Um, so um, I'm going to go in and find my BCC remove effect. Here it is, BCC remover. I'm going to drop that onto this clip. Okay, so by default, um, BCC remover is going to assume that I'm changing a, a spot, like a um, maybe a dead pixel or a, uh, a piece of rig or something like that. In this case, that's not what I want. So I actually want to do a shape. And when I switch it over to clone shape, remo removal method, clone shape, you can see uh, somewhat unhelpfully tells me that um, I need to um, enable pixel chooser and select a shape map. Yeah, I get the idea. I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to do that right here by selecting pixel chooser, mocha on. Okay, done. And, um, and my next step is to launch mocha. Again, you don't need to be a, an expert in mocha to be able to pull off some pretty some basic stuff like like this, right? So I, in this case, I'm a little bit lucky, right? I've got a lot of stuff that I can clone from and clone to. I mean, this is the kind of effect that you could try and pull off using Avid, for example, as, as intra, intra frame editing tools. You might be able to pull this off. It would be somewhat more difficult in Resolve. But it's possible. The, the, the problem is, if you're not pulling a perfect track, it's not going to be um, a perfect clone. And that's where Mocha comes in. And so with Mocha, I know the track is going to be, you know, it's going to be spot on. So I'm going to create an um, X spline by clicking on the X spline button predictably. And I'm going to just draw a basic shape. Okay. And, um, you know, I think if I, if I needed to, um, I could do another shape and tell it to um, blend, do blend mode erase. I think in this case, that's not really necessary, but um, it's, that possibility is always there if I needed it. In this case, uh, I think I've got a decent little, uh, decent little shape. I'm going to track it forward since I'm at the beginning of the clip. Okay. And off she goes. Terrific. Um, and that track is looking uh, fine right now. So I'm going to exit. Saving on my way out. Let's see what we got. I'm going to hit View Mask Match. Okay. So I see just a little bit of movement, which is exactly what I was hoping and expecting to see, which is perfect. The one thing I'm not totally in love with here, and I could have maybe done this in Mocha as well, but I'm going to just feather the edges a touch um, here for in under Pixel Chooser Mask Mocha. Okay, that's looking good. And uh, let's turn off our mask mat and see what we've got. Um, so I'm going to go to, uh, and I'm going to now tell it what region of the image I want to clone from. I can only clone from over here. Since I've got a, a kind of a duplicate window, I think I could also pull a, a somewhat convincing clone from up here. I think I'm going to try that first. Sorry, X Y. Okay. Okay, looking good. Again, I'm using my standard Avid controls, which is to say. Shift key gives me big, broad strokes, and the Option key gives me a little bit more uh, scalpel-y precision, hammer versus scalpel, right? So I've 
cloned an image from up above it to cover up my, at least the attention grabbing parts of my crew. And I hit render. And because the track was uh, spot on, I um, am hopeful that this is going to look pretty good. And in fact, it does. It looks great. Um, so that, uh, while you or I may know that this is somebody's arm, the average viewer won't. And I've totally removed all of the movement where that crew, that crew person was walking around in the background and reflecting on the window. So, um, so I'm pretty happy with that. You know, I mean, ideally, I wouldn't have to do that. Ideally, I'd get um, images that don't have dead pixels, right? Or um, or images that don't have any like auto iris nor flickering, right? Ideally, I'd get images that had like perfect motion all the time. Um, ideally, I'd get shots that had like perfect color balance, right? Um, but obviously, that isn't the way that it works in the documentary world. In the documentary world, we do have all of those problems. We get all of those problems all the time, right? So we do have to smooth out motion on wobbly cameras. We do have to fix dead pixels, right? We do have to fix a, a color issue. We can take it further and tell a story with it by, um, you know, drawing attention to certain parts of the image, right? Um, in the documentary world, we're constantly getting footage that's some odd format or some odd size or that somebody shot on the phone in the wrong direction um, and using the up res and, refram and reframer tools. Um, we can do that and make it look good. The idea is that we're, um, the producers and directors are trying to tell a, a true, you know, a true story about truth and authenticity. And it's our job is to make it look as good as we possibly can while, um, you know, understanding the limitations of what the producers have as they were shooting, uh, even if it means the producers are standing right in front of the window, which they probably shouldn't be doing. Um, at any rate, um, I had a great time talking to you, um, and I thank you for your time.